Good. Good. So I'm going to be back in Mario's book today. We never finished this book. And uh, Linda, Linda asked me last night, did I have a message? I said, no, not yet because I always want to be obedient to the Lord. I can fabricate something, you know, not that easily. <laughs> but but, but uh, I want it to be of the Lord. And so I got up real early this morning, and I was praying yesterday. I was praying last night, and I just said, Lord, what's my message? Because I always want to be obedient to God, and I always want it to be relevant to where we are right now. I don't want to... Uh, recycled messages and so the Lord gave him my answer he's faithful and you know it's funny because the timing of this is just impeccable now y'all don't know everybody don't know everything that's been going on but and that's okay because God does but uh, this right here is I believe the answer to our message and the answer to to where we go uh, from here. If you've been listening to the prophetic voices, and this, and this is not live, I'm recording, but it's not live. Uh, but uh, if you listen to the prophetic voices that we know and trust, because there's a lot of prophetic voices out there that um, that I don't feel comfortable about. So, but God has given us strong, uh, solid prophetic voices that we listen to. And I believe that uh, we're moving into a reset. I believe that, uh, like we've been told, June, July, August is leading up to something, you know, a shaking, uh, whatever's going on. And believe me, whatever can be shaken is being shaken, isn't it? Amen? And uh, we don't know sometimes, you know, what it is we're supposed to do. Uh, some people, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but... Uh, even as a, a, you know, for a long time, I didn't even want to call myself a pastor because I wasn't worthy of that, you know. And I said, Lord, don't, I don't like that. I don't want nobody to call me that because I don't feel like I need to walk with that title. Uh, because uh, we don't know. Sometimes I don't know what to do. Is that okay? I don't know what to preach. I don't know what to teach. I'm just like, I just don't, don't even know what to do. What do you do? You know, you try to act like you got it all together, but it don't work sometimes, does it? But this right here, y'all, is a message from the Lord. And uh, also, too, uh, Judy, I got a message from Cynthia a minute ago, and she said that she had a real good night. Amen. So praise the Lord. There's a young girl that we prayed for. And, and you know, people's crazy, y'all. I mean, people are crazy right now. And uh, have y'all seen a difference? Have you seen things? I mean, has anybody else noticed it? I mean, it's just a lot of craziness going on. And so this young girl, she walked into the uh, church the other night, and she was just, she said, I need help. I need help. I got, I got demons in my house. I don't know what to do. And every, nobody will help me, and I don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm just sitting there going, oh, you know, really, God? I mean, <laughs> of all the stuff we got going on, and, and I'm like, Amy talked to her for a long time. I sat and talked to her about 45 minutes. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Uh, you got, I call them gremlins. I don't know what you call them, you know. But she described them. She tell y'all about them. I don't know if she named them what. But anyway, uh, she wanted rid of them. And so she kept on. And I just said, you know what? Okay, so let's just, let's just go deal with this. And sometimes, you know, how many of y'all know that Satan will set up a trap for you? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have to be discerning. We have to be careful. Right. Because we've probably all fallen into a trap or two, haven't we? Yes. And then you're like, why in the world did I do that? You know? yes. And so I didn't rush. I wouldn't go. She wanted me to go that night. I was like, no, I'm not going over there. I mean, first of all, I don't even know you. Uh, you know, I don't know if the God wants me to go or not. I'm just not going to walk into somebody's house. I said, it's your house. It ain't my house. You need to take authority over. Because yes. I go over there and bless it, but I, I'm leaving and going home. 
Well, she slept in her car the night before. She wouldn't even go in the house. I mean, and she tell me that she got them locked in the closet. I mean, this story went on and on. And then you begin to wonder, you know, is, you know, does the elevator go all the way to the top, you know? <laughs> Are there other things going on in her life? I mean, what's going on? So I just, I said, okay, let's just, I mean, let's just go, let's just go see. Let's go talk to her. So I called Sue and uh, Judy and uh, talked to her for a while. and. And I said, okay, I'm just going. I'm just going to go meet her and talk to her. And so we met her, and anyway, we went through a whole thing. We went over there. And we prayed over the house. We, there were some things in there that we felt there was things attached to. Got rid of all that, and uh, prayed over her. She was scared to death. Bless her heart. She was fearful, very fearful. But she said she had a good night. Praise the Lord. So that's a miracle. So we just needed to keep her in prayer. Lifted up in prayer. Uh, but but I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I got other things to do. I mean, you know, I got a lot of stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff stirred in the atmosphere. I don't want to get involved in something I'm not supposed to be involved in. Uh, so anyway, praise God, it went good, and hopefully she'll get some relief, and she'll learn how to take authority over these and not get herself in situations. And I'm going to tell you what the door was, because immediately when she started talking, I said, you got to open door somewhere. So we, we did not get the answer to that until yesterday, right before we went to her house. And the open door was TikTok. There's some kind of spiritual TikTok. And she said, I was looking for answers. I just wanted to know. And I saw spiritual TikTok. I thought, oh, they're spiritual. And we got that. They're spiritual, all right. And they on the dark side. And so then she started telling me this stuff. I said, that's it right there. And so. We broke, we got, she repented, we prayed over her, broke that off, got the app off her phone. There's some crazy stuff out there, y'all. I mean, Satan, it, he's her trying her every, what's that? They sent her the tarot cards. They, they, okay, listen to this. She locked, I don't know how it works. She watches their videos and she gets caught up in this. And then she said, at first it seemed all right. And then they started wanting her to do yoga. She said, I'm doing yoga with them. I mean, I don't know how you do that on TikTok. But she said, I was going to become the ascended master. And then they started saying, well, God's not real. She said, well, they said that. I knew. Wait a minute now. God is real. Because she believed in God. She was raised in church. I mean, she believed in God. She knew, you know. She said, no. So see, she kind of signed off and went off. But guess what? They mailed her a set of tarot cards. She said, I didn't open them. I just threw them in the closet. And sure. Guess where the demons were? In the closet. And they brought some more in the closet. Oh, yeah. So you think this stuff's not serious? Well, we need to be careful. Wrong by the Chinese. It's owned by the Chinese. They say they track you. They put, When they put that out, they say, we're going to track you wherever you go, whatever you do. When you log in, we can see you. We can follow you. We can watch you. You wrote that? I don't want to, I don't want nobody watching me, especially no Chinese people. You know? So be careful. Be very careful. So anyway, I'm just giving you an update on all that. So the message today, this is this is y'all, this is how God works, because we've been through a battle here. Uh, we we did we started reading this Jezebel book a few weeks ago. And I knew it was going to be, I knew that there was going to be some manifestations when we started. Um, I didn't know the full extent of it, to be honest about it. Um, but we started seeing, you know, that Jezebel is one of the strongholds over this region, she, over the nation. I mean, but this region is very, very staunch Jezebel, religious spirits, political spirits. But we started seeing the manifestation of Jezebel and Ahab. We started seeing Jezebel, I mean, and you know, even we, we have to check ourselves even, you know what I'm saying? The per My purpose in reading the book was I had a pastor friend tell me, and it wasn't even anybody, it wasn't anybody who was even going to church here at the time, but it was a friend that was having some issues and was wanting counseling, and I said, there's something going on with this lady. I knew she had gone to this other church. So I called the other pastor. I said, hey, what's up with this, this lady? Because she came to me, she came to me wanting uh, counseling. 
but there's a spirit there. I said, it's not Jezebel, but there's a spirit there. And she said, oh, it's Ahab. I said, oh, didn't think about that one. But she was absolutely right. And so the spirit that was manifested in this lady was Ahab. And so she and she told me, and she's a, she's been a pastor a whole lot longer than I have. She's ministered a, all over, you know. I trust her. And I said, she said, I'll tell you what you do. Every time, she said, every year I make all my, my leaders read this book. I said, oh, okay. Good idea. So I thought. And so, <laughs> so I'm like, I'll tell you this book. Now it's a good book, John Paul Jackson. John Paul Jackson's very solid. I mean, very, very solid. Very, I mean, I trust it, you know. <coughs> so, anyway, we've been walking through uh, a lot in the last few weeks, have we not, Linda? Absolutely. Linda Joe, I mean, it started, you know, I didn't have nothing to do with it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, I had nothing to do with it. It started with them, and then, and then here it goes, you know, and then next thing you know, it's just all blown up about it. <laughs> but anyway, you know, sometimes. No, it was through me that it manifested. <laughs> but you know what? You're just trying to help somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I told you yesterday, you know, it would make a person not want to help somebody. Oh, yeah. For sure. And so, but you know what? We need to help them anyway. Amen. Amen. We need to set up strong boundaries. We need strong intercessors, strong leadership, but we need to continue to help people. And if, if they come back, I'd help them right now. I would, you know, that I have boundaries, obviously, but but because that's who we are, you know. So anyway, uh, when I when I opened this book this morning, uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, "You never finished Mario." I was like, "Okay, so let's see what Mario's got to say." And so we did, you know, we did the biggest part of this book, but for some reason we stopped and then we went to something else and then we got on something. And so we never got. So today I want to start on chapter 19. I don't know if you have your book. If you do, fine. If you don't, fine. Um, but this answer, Linda, to the situation. Don't slow the train to throw rocks at the barking dogs. Now, y'all got to, you just got to love Mario. He just says it like it is. If you don't like him, that's your problem, you know? He's but, in common sense. Oh, yeah. He's been, doing, he's been there a long time. He's been through a lot. And, uh, you know, we, and, and when we stopped on Mario before, we were talking about Jezebel. We were talking about Elijah. We were talking about Mount Carmel, if y'all remember. That's where we stopped. And now look where we are. Yep. You have decided to make a difference. Your decision is final. Now let me warn you of one thing you must never do. You must never slow the train to throw rocks at barking dogs. Never. I had a friend, he, I call him my friend, but he, uh, Rose and Kevin Sanford, they were from Ireland somewhere. And, uh, but he's, he came to McKaysville and he said, when the dark dogs are barking, keep the wagon rolling. Yep. And that's exactly what he's saying. No matter what happens. Right. Don't be distracted by something going on over here on the side. You got an assignment, you just keep going to your assignment. The dogs will take care of themselves. That's right. Right? And they ain't calling nobody a dog, so don't get me wrong here. I'll be cute to that next. Momentum is one of God's greatest gifts. The benefits of momentum are almost endless. Boiled down to its essential definition, the word momentum means forward motion. You must keep moving forward. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. That's what we do. That's what we continue to do. But be warned that almost immediately after you embark on your vision, all hell will break loose. For no good reason, people will start hating you. You will be persecuted. People close to you will betray you. All this will happen to try and stop you, but again, stopping is the one thing you can never do. Amen. Y'all with me? 
Absolutely. The simplest way to turn your biggest crisis into your biggest opportunity is, your, is to ask yourself, why am I being attacked? It is obvious that you are a threat, but how can you be a threat? There's only one way you can be a threat. If you are God's chosen vessel accomplishing his mission, Amen. the enemy himself is admitting you are a powerful force. Remember, the devil only attacks those he fears. You with me? Is this a, is this not a word from the Lord? Absolutely. This is not me. This is a word from the Lord. I mean, this I didn't have this message until seven o'clock this morning. You know. So this is God talking to us. No matter what happens, we gotta keep our focus, keep our eyes on what it is God's called us to do. Let the dog, let the barking dog bark. Amen. And they're still barking. Amen. Let him we want a new America. We want to transform the direction and condition of our nation. We will never get there if we are tricked into slowing down to respond to attacks, threats, and distractions. Winston Churchill said it this way, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. Amen. Come on, y'all know, y'all know it's true. If we want a new country, we better know the distinct difference between the two words, revival and reformation. One is supposed to lead to the other, but it rarely does, because the train almost never reaches its destination. A revival is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that generates repentance and mass conversions. The church wakes out of slumber and compromise Spilling out of church buildings and into despairing, into a despairing world. The revival's good. Revival's messy. I mean, things get out of control, out of hand. It's not, people say might say it's not in order. I mean, because everything, you know, when, that, when when the Holy Spirit hits and people start getting slain in the Spirit, people start getting uh, manifested, they start getting delivered. I mean, it can be a mess, can it? Revival's good though. But revival is not the answer. Because revival doesn't, revival changes that moment. It might change you for that very moment. But reformation is what we want. Reformation is when you change a society. It's just like if you go and alter you in order to God. So if you walk out that door, you that's right. The world. Amen. Amen. That's exactly it. Salvation, that's step one. People forget there's more than one step. Mark 16 and Matthew 28. Exactly. Exactly. 28 is a reformation. Amen. That's exactly right. Reformation is the next step. The devil bitterly opposes it because of what reformation does to a culture. Here's how revival becomes reformation. Those in revival outgrow emotional experiences and seek to become like Christ. Excitement turns to discipline in a truly transformed person. Reformation becomes the conscience of a nation. It does what the word implies. It reforms. John Wesley, who started the movement that became Methodist, Methodist, Methodistism, Methodism. Methodism, Methodism, did not see just see revival. He saw reformation. The result of his tireless effort was a change in English law. In the last letter Wesley ever wrote, he encouraged William Wilberforce to abolish slavery in Britain, and he did. This reformation also influenced many other righteous laws in Britain. I'm summarizing, J. Wesley breathes England before and after Wesley. Donald Drew notes that several members of Parliament, governors, politicians, bankers, and businessmen were converted to Christianity as a result of Wesley's ministry. It then shows the main the many streams of legal transformation that flowed from them. Reformation is the fruit of revival. Amen, yes. We have to have that. She said reformation is the fruit of revival. We can't stop at revival. That's what's happened to a lot of outpouring. They never made it past that emotional part of revival to move into reformation. 
So the culture wasn't changed. This sounds like the sound of freedom is doing it. What they're doing is going to bring reformation. Amen. emancipators during the 19th century. There is time to mention only a few of their names. Wilberforce and Clarkson, slavery abolished. Lord Shatsbury, Sadler, industrial emancipation. Elizabeth Fry, John Howard, prison reform. Glissom, ship safe, safety regulations. Hannah Moore, Robert Brakey's Sunday schools established. So here's the thing, we don't need another book that stirs people if it has no permanent result. That is the last thing I want for this book. Again and again, we have seen movements rise and then fall away before their time and before their destiny. We don't want that again. We can't afford to have that again. It's got to be reformation. You know, they might not have had the fullness of understanding on that then. But I think we've got a much greater understanding of that now. I pray that you will be imbued with a perseverance that will never stop and never slow down. Having said this, let's move on to the answer of how to keep the locomotive going forward. There's four factors that slow the train. Let's, look, let's take a look at four factors that will cause you to slow the train. Panic, criticism, betrayal, and distraction. Four things. Number one, panic. Panic is sudden, uncontrollable fear and anxiety, often causing wildly unthinking behavior. We saw the best example of this in the previous chapter. Elijah slowed the train out of panic. He had Ahab and Jezebel dead to rights. He came so close to bringing deliverance to a nation, but he panicked. And the result was a fiery revival that it did not that did not go on to reform Israel. Here's what the pulpit commentary says about that moment. History tells of many great souls, hardly less brave than Elijah's, which have succumbed to a sudden panic. Anyhow, it is evident for that for the moment Elijah had lost his faith in God, otherwise he would certainly have waited for the word of the Lord, which had hitherto invariably guided his movements. Notice how it says that every other time Elijah waited for the word of the Lord before any important decision. We can learn from his mistake. Let's take a closer look. Elijah was disappointed that Jezebel was not afraid of God and the astounding miracle of Mount Carmel. This truly shocked him. But Jezebel was not afraid for a reason. It is embedded in these verses. 1 King 19, 1-3 And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he, rode, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Ahab did not mention God or how the fire consumed everything. He told her what Elijah had done. He makes it seem like Elijah performed a magic trick and then fooled the people into killing the prophets of Baal. Another clue is her reaction, so what the gods do to me. If she had seen the astonishing way the fire fell, she wouldn't talk so easily about other gods. So number two is criticism. The Welsh Revival, 1904 to 1905, was one of the purest demonstrations of mass conversion and conviction of sin in modern history. 100,000 men were converted in Wales in a movement led by young Evan Roberts. 
Now, Evan Roberts, do y'all remember the dream by Gina Golston about the mantle? That's who she's talking about. But harsh criticism mixed with physical and emotional exhaustion sent him on a downward spiral. He began hearing voices and doubted his ability to discern the source. He became obsessed with self-examination and was harsh toward his audience. Finally, a modern Jezebel, Jesse Penn Lewis, a Welsh evangelical speaker and author, enticed him. According to Jennifer McClare, this is a quote, Penn Lewis seduced and received the revivalist in his prime of his anointing. Penn Lewis, whose doctrine was largely rejected in Wales, and is even now described as apostate teaching by some modern theologians, sought to ride on Robert's coattails. Ironically, this Jezebel-like woman flattered him with words and aimed to ease the suffering he was experiencing from the religious spirits of mid-revival. But her smooth words didn't heal his soul. He suffered a nervous breakdown and went to live at this wealthy woman's home to recover. So you see what Jezebel does? You see how Jezebel does not like the move of God? How Jezebel came in even, that's a great revival, 100,000. He prayed, Lord, get on 100,000 souls. And he got it, plus a whole lot more. But yet, because he was tired, I mean, he was physically tired, like Elijah was physically tired can you imagine? Can you imagine what Elijah went through? I can't imagine it. I don't even know. How do you kill 850 people? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just, they just stand there. I mean, is it supernatural, you know? I mean, how does that work? Uh, but he was tired. He was physically tired. And there was a letdown, you know, after a, a big after a big game. If you're ever uh, played sports or something, you get when you're done, you're just like, go sit down and rest, you know? Uh, but he fell into that. And he never, he never recovered from that. He never went back to preaching or anything. Can you imagine that? And he was young. He was in his 20s when that happened. Before I say more about criticism, let me pause briefly to address the T. There is nothing noble or spiritual about wearing yourself out. Being physically or emotionally exhausted can make you more vulnerable to spiritual attack and temptation. It can even be prideful. The pride of thinking that everything God is doing is being done by you and cannot be done without you. Now back to criticism. It can be lethal because of how it makes us feel. The most hurtful criticisms are the ones that attack us in the very areas we are working so hard to improve. But it is all about the feelings. See, we can't, we can't work off of emotions. We've got to learn to get past that. Don't believe everything you feel. Feelings are not facts. I like that. Feelings are not facts. Feelings are feelings. They do not always objectively represent what is taking place around you. Feelings of shame, embarrassment, frustration, anger, inadequacy, and hopelessness are based on a lie. It is hard at the moment of criticism to separate the fact from the fiction. And so, you know, I've had to just say, when, I, when I've had people criticize me, I've had to just say, you know, that's not true. You know, you know and, and I just kind of let it go. And uh, y'all heard me say it before, but I had a, a man tell me uh, years ago, uh, before I actually started the church, but I was ministering to people, and he told me, he said, it's really none of your business what other people think about you. It's none of your business what they say about you. You don't need to even entertain that. You need to go on, move on, and don't worry about it. You know, if you're called to do something, if God's called you to do something, then you do it, and don't worry about it. Somebody called it in. That's right. That's right. And you know, and, and, and there's always probably, I won't say always, but a lot of times there's a little bit of truth. You know, somebody might criticize, they might say something, but there might be a little bit of truth in there. 
might be a whole lot of lie, but there might be a little tiny bit of truth. You know, when somebody accuses me of something, I always ask the Lord, is it true? You know, instead of attacking and say, going back and say, Lord, is that true? Is there anything in there that I need to repent of? Is there anything that I've done? And if you show me something, I do. Because we can always fall short. We always fall short. Regardless, you know. But then I'll say, Lord, you know my heart. Because God knows our heart. He's the only one. Other people, people, even people that you know real well, they don't necessarily know your heart. Nope. They don't know really why you're doing that or what you know what you're thinking. I, I look at it this way. When somebody attacks me, they attack Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. And you don't know what that person's been through. Most of the time, it's coming out of a hurt that they have, a wound that they have. So we don't need to take it personal. We just need to turn it around and say, how can I help them? What is it? You know, there's something, you know, like you might remind them of their great grandma that smacked them in the, you know, when they were six or something. I mean, it could be something that, that doesn't even have anything to do with you. Well, we also need to remember to what fruit they bear. Amen. And that will give us yes. an answer right there. Amen. And the, the word says you'll know them by their fruit. I just ignore Yeah, you won't, you won't know them. I mean, you can't tell. You meet somebody on the street, they don't tell you what they think you want to hear a lot of times. Or even people who come to church, they're going to act real nice in church, but what are they going to do when they get home? i tell you what they're going to do. They're going to do what's in their heart. Yes. When they call you up and leave you a message and they say it, if and this and if and that and blah, 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 and I'm going to hurt you. And I'm, you think, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> That's what's inside. That's right. The pressure got applied. And when the pressure is applied, what's inside will come out. So you will know them by their fruit. That's what the word tells us. All right, we're back on Mario again. Think of it this way. There's an element of truth in almost every criticism. But that is not important right now. Not if it gets you to slow the train. You might be obsessed with getting to the bottom of why a newspaper, magazine, or other media outlet said unfair or horrible things about you. Watch out. That is your subtle desire to please people. We all have that, probably. We want to please people. We want people to think good about us, you know. We want people to like us. But really, we ought to be worried more about what's God saying. What does God think? You might also be overtaken by fear that this criticism will destroy your plans. Here is how you handle it. See the criticism as a town your train is passing through. Soon it will be behind you. So don't get hung up on it. People want to criticize you? Okay, let them criticize you. Later you can reflect on valid criticism when you are in a much stronger condition. Finally, I do not talk or answer any accusations from leftist media. Why would I give comments to liars? They will just twist anything I say. So it's best just don't don't try to argue with fool. I mean, don't don't do it. Somebody trying to cuss you and scream and yell at you, don't try to argue with them. They're going to turn everything around that you have said, and it's going to be your fault. Don't quarrel. Don't quarrel. That's right. All right. Number three is betrayal. None of us like to be betrayed. Martin Luther King said, Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Betrayal is unavoidable. It is the one attack that comes out of nowhere. It is one of the last things you expect. 
see when Linda and Joe started getting attacked, I said, mm, I'm not putting up with that. And so I made a comment. I, I, I said, no, I'm not doing that. We're not doing that. That's not right. And I corrected them, and they didn't like it at all. But I'm not going to just stand there and let them do that. And you shouldn't either. No, it wasn't right. It wasn't right at all. So we need to speak up. We need to be bold. We need to do it, you know, in love. But at the same time, we need to, when somebody is attacking somebody, you know it's not true. You know that they're, what they're saying is a lie. You don't just sit there and agree with them. You don't sit there and let them do that. The church has been silent too long. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Yes. I mean, we need got we got to stand up, folks, and we've got to be bold. Why does betrayal happen? I can think of three common reasons. Number one is false expectations. Read this carefully. Your closest relationships have one thing in common: expectation. When I befriend or hire someone, I must be very careful to understand what they expect of me. I ask myself. What are they hoping to get from this relationship? It never occurred to me to check for this until the same form of betrayal kept happening repeatedly, making me wonder what was going on. Each time we went through a betrayal, the person would gossip to someone else about how I had broken a promise to them. Here's the critical part. In every case, I had never, ever made the promise to them. It was simply an expectation that they had built up in their minds. This is what I am going to get from knowing Mario. That's when I realized I must be very clear, and so must you. I realized I must ask point blank, what do you expect to come out of our friendship? Or what do you expect to gain from working with Mario Murillo Ministries? Let me add quickly that this must work both ways. My close friends are not a means to an end for me. I love them and am devoted to being a good friend. And the same goes to those who work for me. The second common reason for betrayal is not knowing someone's true nature. You can know someone for years and not know what they will be like in the heat of a battle. We are dealing with some very hot issues. It will amaze you when push comes to shove how many spirit-filled believers are in favor of abortion, transgenderism, and gay marriage. What in the world? How can we support that, y'all? If we read the Bible, if we follow the Bible, we cannot support something that's totally against it. Doesn't mean we hate the people. Doesn't mean we can't help the people. But we cannot support it. We cannot back it. We cannot support it. I've been waiting to share something, Shelly, that I heard from a friend of mine that stopped me yesterday and he couldn't wait to share this with me because it broke his heart so bad. Are we talking about that so everybody can hear I had a friend that I saw yesterday and he could when he saw me he couldn't wait to share what he had experienced. And in the darkness is so prevalent out there and it's coming from the media in every direction. So you just have to be very careful. But what he shared with me is he says, I've been listening to a radio station, 89.3 or 7, I can't remember. He says, it's preachers preaching. And he said, I was listening to this guy preach this message. And he said, one of the first things he said that got his attention was that God should not have showed up in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve because he was a sinner, because God is a sinner. So this man said, his, name, his first name is Howard, he says, I, I'm i gonna listen to see what this is all about. And the, the pastor that was preaching was saying, and God should not have showed up for David God should not have showed up for Moses 
And God should not have showed up for when Jesus was being crucified because Jesus was being crucified for God's sins. Now, how sick is that? I'm just telling you, we've got to be careful about what, what we hear. I mean, he says, I turned that radio station off and I will not ever listen to that thing again. He was torn up over it. And, yeah, and it, was, it, it is something to rattle your cage yeah. and make you think about, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Wow. That's why we need to have uh, discernment because, uh, you know, there's some, there's some crazy people out there, y'all. Yeah. Y'all didn't know that. I thought I better tell you. But there's some real crazy people out there. Okay, Bible printed down, too. Lord have mercy. It's unbelievable some of the things nowadays, isn't it? We have to go with. I just shake my head sometimes. I'm like, what in the world? But you know, when we hear something like that, what we need to do is call the radio station. We need to call them. We need to email them. We need to write them. We need to say, wait a minute. This guy that was on at such and such time, that might, that might, you need to get him off there and you need a public apology for that. Right. It's not scriptural. That's not scriptural at all. That's, that's dumb. I mean, that's just plain dumb, you know? It's, it's evil. There's crazy stuff out there. You know, you can justify just about anything you want if you try hard enough. I mean, we have, like Linda said, you've got the gay Bible, you got, I mean, and say what they want to. It's not It's not biblical. No. You know, you can have your own religion, but God's not going to be at the helm of it if you're supporting some other gospel. And that's just insane. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, no. I got scripture for that here in just a minute, too. All right, the first time your organization is attacked for these things, those folks are suddenly unavailable. Sometimes it is not even that they believe in these immoralities they simply don't want to fight. The third common reason for betrayal has to do with change. You have changed in your promotion and improvement. You are breaking up the old game. Your new level of zeal is not comfortable for them. Few things hurt as badly as being betrayed, but keep moving. Winston Churchill famously said, if you're going through hell, keep going. I couldn't agree more. Is that, who said that? Yeah. I thought that was just a country song. <laughs> yeah. You're too, you got too zealous for them. We get comfortable. I mean, I say we, people get comfortable in their sin sometimes. And they just, you know, they just want to stay right there. I got saved, you know, 1949. I, Got my fire insurance. I'm, that's all I need. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. I don't think that's biblical. Yeah. We're supposed to be like Christ. I know it hurts to be betrayed, but once again, feelings are not your enemy. Go ahead and feel it, but do not slow the train. You are just passing through. It might also help you to remember that while it's true, some passengers will get off the train, it's also true that some better ones will jump on. I believe that. Amen. Number four is distraction. Welcome to the Big Daddy. The number one thing that slows the train is distraction. It, yeah, there's so many distractions going on. I mean, the news media knows that. The government knows it. Yeah. Look at all the distractions. You've ever noticed when the, something's going on, they look at it, a hundred laptop or something, then all of a sudden you got something going on over here. It's just a distraction, y'all. Right. It's kind of like the left today. Yeah. Good at that. Especially in the political side. Yeah. I know. This book is not about martial arts, but Bruce Lee once said, it is not daily increase, but daily decrease. Half away the unessential. The closer to the source, the less wastage there is. 
there is simply no way you can juggle what you were doing before with what you want to do now. You will have to hack away at everything unessential. So is that purging again, so your favorite word. Nothing will demand more courage or discipline than removing distractions from your life. It does not just demand courage, but brutal courage. Um, what's the main purpose of social media? Distraction. How many times have you been looking on Facebook or something and the app, you look down and the hours gone by and you've been sitting there scrolling and look at these little city videos and reading all that. Is it just me? I know. I was just thinking that last night. I was like, I don't want the distraction. No, no you I'm don't on the mission it. here. Amen, Amy. <laughs> but, you, but you know, that's what all that is. Kids, look at the kids. They're so caught up in it. I mean, they look at that phone. They walk around looking at that phone all the time. Notice that in the grocery store a lot. Oh, yeah. They're either the child sitting in the seat of the cart with an iPad or whatever, or they're walking down the aisle like this, following my mom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's an so addiction. It is an addiction. I had a friend in there. Uh, child got old enough to drive and they were getting their driver's license and and he said she don't know where anything is i said what do you mean she don't know where anything is uh, she drove with you i mean she lived around here been here her whole life and she can't get nowhere in the car because she never paid attention she just always looking at the phone oh, wow. <laughs> that's bad isn't it <laughs> i'm like wow i never thought about that when people don't know where nothing is Distraction can take many forms. That secure position may just be a distraction or worse, a prison. Staying at all, staying at that same desk because of your obligations is a disastrous move if it means you cannot answer the real call in your life. Money is often the worst thing to consider when you hear the call of God. People can be a distraction. If you're a kind person, I promise you there is someone in your life who is self-invited and inappropriate in their demands on you. Is that true? They mistake your kindness as weakness. Kindness is not weakness. It's because you're kind to somebody doesn't mean you're weak. Right. I'm kind, but I'm not weak. I've been through too much to be weak. You know? You're not weak wow. either. We help people that need help because that's what we're called to do. In the Old Testament, Nehemiah was constantly asked to attend meetings with people who undermined God's work. And here's how he reacted. This is Nehemiah 6, 1 through 3. Now when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although at the time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. I should have gave him a hint right there. Don't go to Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I come down to you? See, that's where we need to be. We've got a work to do. We've got things to do. God has called us to do some, some, some things. We are each have an assignment on our life. And we can't be distracted by those who want to pull us off the wall. By those who want to pull you down. To do the tent crusades on Highway 99 that had become so amazing, I had to do something painful. I had to stop doing conferences. I discovered that conferences, especially the ones that have gone on year after year without change, must be guilty until proven innocent. In this climate of division and persecution of the church, 
It is simply too tempting to do things that have no chance of bringing America back to God. W-O-W-S-E is the acronym for with or without someone else. You must develop a strong W-O-W-S-E factor. It means what it says. You are determined to do what God has called you to do with or without someone else. This train is not stopping. If others are not on board, you must keep moving, even if you go it alone. Amen. This train's not stopping. The dogs can be very loud. They can be very convincing. But your mission is too great, and the stakes are too high for you to risk not reaching your destination. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss my destination. I don't want to miss what it is that God has for me and what he has for each one of us. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it because I'm having to defend myself or argue with somebody or, or trying to make up for something I didn't even do anyway. I don't want to do it. You know, if you want to come, come on. Let's do this thing. But don't hold me back. Don't distract me. I'm going on. Amen. I'm going forward. Amen? Amen? Once you know your mission and your direction, start. You must create momentum as soon as possible. Do not wait until every objection is answered before you start. If you do, you will never start. We're not going to do it. We're going to be like Nehemiah. I ain't coming down. No, no. You stay down there. No, no. I'm going on. Amen. Don't get bogged down with the details of your journey or how your plans will come together. Just fire up the locomotive and watch the momentum build. Hallelujah. The final urgency is time. We have no idea how much time we have before freedom's torch is extinguished. We are now seeing the promise of a vast season. Whatever you are going to do, you must do it now. I believe now is the time, and I believe we have stepped into a new season. I believe we've stepped into uh, a new era for us and for our nation too. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. The devil will tell you that you are not qualified. Relatives will tell you that you are crazy to try this. Guilt, obligation, threats, and hatred will bark at you to slow you down. You may not know how to do this. Do it anyway. You may not know where the money will come from. Keep the wagon rolling. Hallelujah. Amen. John Maxwell said, Momentum solves 80% of your problems. I agree with him. Believe, I believe your doubts, fears, and questions about getting your destination, getting to your destination can be crushed beneath the wheels if you just keep moving. Wow. <laughs> That's right, be single-minded, be focused. There's just some notes that I had made. When the wall of religion topples, Jezebel comes out in full force. She works off fear and intimidation. The regional strongholds that I believe that the Holy Spirit showed me, y'all may have others, but religion, Jezebel, and political spirits. I think that's a three-stranded cord right there, evil. But but those are the ones that we have pro dealt with prominently in this area. Say that again, please. Uh, religion, religious spirits, Jezebel, and political spirits. We sometimes mistake the confirmation on Mount Carmel as being been as is one between Elijah and Jezebel. But that's not really true. Jezebel wasn't even there. King Ahab was there. The battle on Mount Carmel was not to defeat Jezebel, but to reset the lordship of Jehovah. Is that not what we're trying to do right now? Is that not what we're, the, the prophets are talking about, reset, reset, reset? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put God back in uh, over the nation, one nation under God. Try to put God back into 
the, the kingship of this nation. Some will run when Jezebel comes, like Elijah, but keep your focus on your assignment. Don't fall prey to her tricks. Don't get distracted by the barking. Don't get distracted by those who want to pull you off your assignment and steal your destiny. When the dogs are barking, know that you're on the right track. Y'all need to write this down now. When the dogs are barking, keep the wagons rolling. We don't stop to, put, to check out the dogs, do we? We keep going. Don Lynch, Dr. Don Lynch, some of y'all knew him. Um, he said, to properly finish our assignments, we must always be focused upon the remnant more than the current specific confrontation. Winning one battle does not finish the war. Finishing the war merely begins the process of expanding the kingdom culture. Kingdom without culture is just a smoking altar on a distant mountain, soon to become a memorial instead of a mandate. We don't want it to become a memorial. We're not trying to do that. That's not what we're trying to do. God told him what to do with the rest of his life. Talking about Elijah. Then uh, he started doing what he should have been doing all along. He started preparing the Lord a people so a prophetic company, an Elijah company, would be available for leadership in the land. God's been preparing a remnant, a prophetic company that can't be swayed, bought, or convinced otherwise. And they won't fall prey to the distractions that come to tear them away from their assignments. And what I mean by prophetic company, I don't mean a group of prophets. I mean a people who can accurately anticipate what's coming and be prepared to respond to what God's doing. Amen. That's it. See, God chose to do it with people. He chose to use flawed, imperfect people. Jesus could, if Jesus, uh, if Jesus was going to do it himself, it would have already been done. But he chose to use people. He did his part. That's right. He did his part. He turned it over to. Us, he said, go do what I've told you to do. It's almost like he's training us through this whole thing. Amen. That's it. Yeah. So where do we start? We start right here. We determine to get ourselves right before the Lord. We get all these ugly spirits out of ourselves, and uh, we kill the political spirit if we've got any of that in us. We consecrate ourselves to the Lord, fully surrender to him for his work. We die to flesh. That's a big one right there. We want to blame a lot of things on the devil. The devil made me do it. No, you just did it because you wanted to do it. Basically. All those things we have studied, all those things we've lived, all those things that we've walked through, Linda, like you said, all the things that we're going through, uh, those, all those things, those are valuable learning experiences. You know, I don't count any of them uh, as bad. You know, God is training us through this whole thing. And then he followed that up with saying, we are being prepared to learn how to be victorious. Amen. He's Amen. He's teaching I us how to be victorious. That's he's, right. He's preparing an army. And we're, mm -hmm. That's right. How about that? We must uh, prepare ourselves. We must surrender it all to him. Uh, we must die to our own flesh, pick up our cross daily, follow him in all that he calls us to do. See, the heart of the Father is always redemption. Uh, he, he comes to redeem his people. So I thank God for that. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've been through, he's always there for us. He's always has his hand stretched out ready to receive us back into his family. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Romans 13, 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. 
So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's where we have to go. The lies for the hour is late. Amen. It's purity. Amen. Holiness. Purity. Matthew 7, verse 20 through 23. Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? But then I will declare the, to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice evil. So we need to check our own hearts. We need to know where we stand with the Lord. We need to be certain about what God has called us to do. And we need to not worry, not be distracted, not get off course, not be worried about what other people say or what other people think. Just do the right thing. Do what's right. And always remember when someone attacks you that that's probably coming out of a hurt or a wound that they have. And, you know, ask the Lord, what is it in them? What is it in that person that's causing that reaction? Something might have triggered them. You may have said something that triggered them. Maybe the way you looked at them, the way you responded to them. may not have anything to do with you. We had somebody uh, one day that said, well, she reminded me. You know, I got mad at her because she reminds me of her, my aunt that was mean to me. What? You know? <laughs> okay? So, there's something. It's always something else, usually. So, um, but I think this is a very timely message. And I think that the Lord gave us this message to the day. And so we need to just, the dogs are barking, keep the wagon rolling. Don't get distracted. Don't stop. Just keep going. Those that are called to be on that journey with you, they'll jump. They'll join you. They'll get. They'll jump on that moving train. They'll come behind you. Come beside you. Just keep going. Just keep your focus and let God lead you. Amen. Does anybody want to have anything they want to add to this? I know we've been through a lot here this morning, but. Any comments? I, I want to say, uh, I'm trying to find it. Somebody posted it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. But the, the dinner that was being had someplace, and the pastor asked an older gentleman, old country. Oh, yeah. I posted it. Yeah, I remember that. He, he asked him to say the blessing. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the man started out saying, Oh, Lord, you know how bad. I hate that lard. It's so terrible. Oh, Lord, you know how I hate that flower. You got it? Read it. Because it's got more meaning. It's got a very powerful meaning to it. A pastor asked an older farmer decked in, out in his bib overalls to say grace for the morning breakfast. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer began. The visiting pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer and wonder where this was going. The farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued, And Lord, you know I don't care much for that raw white flour. The, power, the pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room and saw that he wasn't the only one feeling uncomfortable. But then the farmer added, But Lord, when you mix them all together, and bake them. I do love those warm, fresh biscuits. So, Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you're done mixing. It'll probably be even better than biscuits. Amen. <laughs> very powerful yeah. word right there. Very good. 
separately, they're all hooked together. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, so to me, that was saying, you better walk through these trials, but wait to get through this trial and see what's on the other side. Because God's got something there. That's right. A lot of times we jump, jump train and thinking that that's not where we're supposed to be or that's not where God's taking us. And, and God's saying, yeah, it is. Get back on the train. Yeah. So. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to ask you, Linda, to pray. Pray over the food, too, Mark, Adam, Gordon, Father God, we thank you so very much for the word you've given us today, the encouragement, Lord Jesus, and the, uh, the teaching and the understanding of your word. Lord, it's so valuable to us. Lord, and I thank you for that. And I thank you for Shelly for her obedience and, and to present it today, such a timely message. And Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of today and the fellowship of today. Lord, I thank you for the food that's been prepared. I pray your blessings over the hands that prepared it. And I pray that it would be nourishment to our bodies, Lord, as we fellowship one with another, Lord. Because sometimes we just spend a whole week waiting for today so that we can fellowship together. And we thank you, Lord, for your blessings, for God that's in strength be with us all today as we go our separate ways and give us a good week together until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. We want to thank Amy for all that cooking she did. Yes, thank you, Miss Amy.